Welcome back to Double Helix, Blueprint of Nations. Today, we're diving into one of the most critical and transformative years of the American Civil War, 1863. This year, more than any other, saw the conflict reach its boiling point. It was a year of intense struggle where every battle, every decision, seemed to carry the weight of the entire war on its shoulders. The stakes had never been higher, and the future of the nation hung in the balance. You know, when we talk about 1863, we're not just talking about Gettysburg and Chancellorsville, although those battles were, of course, pivotal. We're talking about the relentless campaigns in the Western theater as well, where Union forces were making significant gains, particularly with the capture of Vicksburg, a victory that would prove to be a turning point in the war. This was the year when the Union strategy of dividing the Confederacy began to bear fruit, cutting the South in two and crippling its ability to sustain the war effort. But beyond the battles, 1863 was also the year the war's purpose began to evolve in a profound way. With the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation at the start of the year, the conflict took on a new dimension. It wasn't just about preserving the Union anymore. It was about redefining what that Union stood for. The inclusion of African-American soldiers in the Union Army symbolized this shift, as they fought not only for the Union's survival, but for their own freedom and the future of their people. In this episode, titled Crucible of War, we'll explore the titanic struggles of both the Eastern and Western theaters where victories and defeats carried enormous consequences. We'll see how Robert E. Lee's audacious tactics at Chancellorsville led to one of his most celebrated victories, and yet, how the tide turned against him just a few months later at Gettysburg. At the same time, we'll journey to the banks of the Mississippi, where Ulysses S. Grant's relentless campaign to capture Pittsburgh finally delivered a critical blow to the Confederacy. And let's not forget the political and social shifts of the year. The Emancipation Proclamation, issued by Abraham Lincoln, not only altered the course of the war, but also the very nature of the nation itself. It was a bold, defining statement that this war would also be a war for freedom. So join me as we step into 1863, a year that would test the resolve of a divided nation like never before. Whether it's on the bloody fields of Gettysburg, in the siege lines of Vicksburg, or in the heart of newly freed men fighting for the Union, we'll see how this crucible of war began to forge a new United States, one that was stronger, more just, and irrevocably change. Welcome to Double Helix, Blueprint of Nations. Season 2, Episode 2.8, Crucible of War. As 1863 dawned, the Union found itself in a precarious position. The previous year had been a mixed bag. Victories in the Western theater had provided some glimpses of hope, but in the East, things were looking rather grim. Despite President Lincoln's bold move with the Emancipation Proclamation, which promised to change the very nature of the war, the Union's army's confidence was still quite shaky. And why wouldn't it be? Just months earlier, they'd been bested by Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia at Fredericksburg, a defeat that was both humiliating and demoralizing. The Northern public, desperate for a swift end to the bloodshed, was starting to lose patience. And so was Lincoln. Here's when we meet Major General Joseph Hooker, affectionately known by his man as Fighting Joe. He was the latest in a line of commanders tasked with doing what George McClellan, Ambrose Burnside, and others had failed to do. Take the fight to Lee and deliver a decisive victory in the East. Hooker was confident, even brash. He reorganized the Army of the Potomac, Boosting morale would improve rations, better sanitation, and regular drills. 
He even set up a centralized cavalry corps to match the Confederate horsemen who had so often run rings around the Union forces. But Hooker's greater strength, his boldness, was also his Achilles heel. By late April, Hooker had a plan he believed would crush Lee once and for all. He intended to use his superior numbers to outmaneuver the Confederates, forcing them into a disadvantageous position. It was a sound strategy on paper. He'd leave a portion of his forces to keep Lee's attention at Fredericksburg while sending the bulk of his army on a flanking march to catch Lee from behind. Confident in his plan, Hooker declared, The rebel army is now the legitimate property of the Army of the Potomac. Robert E. Lee, however, was not one to be easily outflanked. Facing an opponent with twice his numbers, Lee did the unthinkable. Instead of retreating, he divided his already outnumbered forces, leaving a small contingent under General Jubal Early at Fredericksburg. Lee sent General Stonewall Jackson with 28,000 men to execute a daring flanking maneuver of his own. On May 1st, Hooker's forces encountered Confederate troops in the dense thickets of the wilderness, a nightmarish landscape of tangled underbrush and narrow paths that nullified the Union's numerical advantage. Hooker, inexplicably, decided to pull back and adopt a defensive posture. This hesitation proved costly. Sensing weakness, Lee and Jackson sprang into action. In one of the most audacious moves of the war, Jackson led his men on a 12-mile march through the wilderness, completely out of sight of the Union Army. On the evening of May 2nd, Jackson unleashed his assault on Hooker's right flank, catching the Union forces completely off guard. What ensued was chaos. Confederate troops poured out of the woods, rolling over the Union line like a tidal wave. Thousands of Union soldiers fled in panic, and Hooker's grand plan began to crumble before it even started. But as night fell, fate dealt Lee and Jackson a cruel hand. While scouting ahead of his lines, Jackson was accidentally shot by his own men. The South had lost one of its most brilliant commanders, and Lee, though victorious at Chancellorsville, was left without his most trusted lieutenant. Despite this tragic setback, the Confederate victory at Chancellorsville was complete. Lee had outmaneuvered and outthought an enemy twice his size, proving once again that audacity often trumps numbers. Chancellorsville was a bitter pill for the North to swallow. Lincoln reportedly lamented, My God, my God, what will the country say? Hooker, who had started the campaign with so much promise, was left reeling. His indecision in the face of Lee's boldness had cost the Union dearly, and he would soon find himself replaced. But the Union Army's woes didn't end with Hooker's defeat. The victory emboldened Lee, convincing him that the time was ripe for another invasion of the North. As we'll see, the events set in motion by Chancellorsville would lead to one of the most significant and bloodiest confrontations of the entire war. But before we get to Gettysburg, let's first follow Lee's army as they marched northwards, bringing the war to the Union's doorstep. After the stunning Confederate victory at Chancellorsville, Lee was riding high on a wave of confidence. His army had proven time and again that it could outmaneuver and outfight the Union forces, despite being outnumbered and outgunned. For Lee, the time had come to shift the war's momentum in a more decisive direction. The Confederate general, never one to rest in his laurels, began planning his next bold move, a second invasion of the North. Lee's strategy was ambitious, to say the least. The Confederacy was running low on supplies, and the Southern economy was buckling under the strain of the war. A successful invasion of the North could alleviate some of these pressures by allowing his army to live off of the land in the rich agricultural areas of Pennsylvania. But, more importantly, a decisive victory on Union soil might demoralize the northern public so much that it will bolster the anti-war sentiment and pressure Lincoln's administration into seeking a peace deal. And so, in early June 1863, 
Lee began moving his army of northern Virginia northwards. His plan was to threaten Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, hoping that the Union army would be lured into a major battle on ground of his choosing. Lee's ultimate objective? Strike a blow so devastating that it would bring the North to the negotiating table. As Lee's forces began their march, Union General Joseph Hooker, still licking his wounds from Chancellorsville, scrambled to figure out what his Confederate counterparts was up to. Intelligence reports were hazy, and it was clear that Lee was on the move. The problem was, nobody knew exactly where he was headed. While Lee moved with confidence, the Union High Command was in disarray. Hooker's inability to anticipate Lee's movements and his overall lackluster performance had eroded Lincoln's already tenuous confidence in him. As the Confederate Army slipped further into Pennsylvania, Hooker's indecision reached a breaking point. Sensing that Hooker was out of his depth, Lincoln made a bold decision. He relieved Hooker of command and appointed General George Gordon Meade as the new commander of the Army of the Potomac, just three days before what would become the most famous battle of the war. Now, Let's pause here for a moment to consider the position Meade found himself in. Imagine being handed the reins of an army just days before it's expected to confront one of the most formidable forces in the world at that time, led by a general whose reputation for audacity and brilliance was unmatched. It was a situation that would have tested the mettle of any commander, but Meade accepted the challenge with grim determination. He was no stranger to the battlefield. Meade was a career soldier who had proven himself at places like Antietam and Fredericksburg. But this, this was something else entirely. Meanwhile, as Meade was taking command, Lee's army was already deep in Pennsylvania, spreading out to gather supplies. His troops moved through towns like Chambersburg, Carlisle, and York, sowing panic in their wake. For many Northerners, this was the first time that they had even seen the enemy up close, and the sight of Confederate soldiers marching through their hometowns was nothing short of terrifying. But Lee's army wasn't just there to instill fear. They were also there to do some serious foraging. Confederate soldiers helped themselves to food, livestock, and any other supplies that they could lay their hands on. And while Lee had issued strict orders against pillaging and violence against civilians, those orders weren't always followed to the letter. Back in Washington, D.C., Lincoln was watching these developments with growing anxiety. The Capitol was buzzing with rumors and speculations about where Lee would strike. Would he go for Philadelphia? Baltimore? Even Washington itself? The uncertainty was almost unbearable. Lincoln knew that the outcome of the coming battle could very well determine the fate of the nation. As Lee's forces continued to push northwards, Meade was moving his army to intercept them. The two forces were on a collision course, and it was only a matter of time before they met. The stage was set for what would become the bloodiest battle in American history, a battle that would not only determine the course of the Civil War, but quite possibly the future of the United States itself. And so, as June turned into July, the Union and the Confederate armies closed in on a small town in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. The fate of the two nations were about to be decided in three days of brutal and relentless combat. As dawn broke on July 1, 1863, few in the sleepy town of Gettysburg could have predicted the seismic events that were about to unfold. For the Union and Confederate soldiers converging on this crossroads town, it was just another day in the grueling campaign that had defined their lives for the past two years. But as fate would have it, Gettysburg would soon become the setting for one of the most crucial battles in all of American history. The battle began almost by accident. Confederate forces, under General Henry Heth, had entered Gettysburg in search for supplies, particularly shoes which were in short supply for Lee's army. Unbeknownst to them, Union cavalry, under the command of General John Buford, had already set up a defensive position just outside the town. Buford, a West Point graduate and a seasoned cavalry officer, 
had a sharp eye for terrain. When he saw the ridges and high grounds around Gettysburg, he knew this was where the Union could make a stand. He wasn't going to let the Confederates take it without a fight. As Hett's men advanced towards the town, they ran headlong into Buford's cavalry. The skirmish quickly escalated into a full-blown battle as both sides scrambled to bring reinforcements. By mid-morning, the fields west of Gettysburg were filled with smoke and chaos. The Confederates were determined to push through and seize the high ground, while Buford's men fought desperately to hold them off. Meanwhile, Union General John Reynolds, commanding the First Corps, was advancing to Gettysburg, racing headlong. Reynolds was one of the Union's most respected generals. He was brave, decisive, and highly regarded by his peers. He knew that if the Union could hold the high ground around Gettysburg, they'd have a strong defensive position against Lee's advancing army. But Reynolds' arrival on the battlefield would be tragically short-lived. As he led his troops into the fray, Reynolds was struck down by a Confederate bullet, becoming one of the highest-ranking officers killed in the battle. Despite the loss of Reynolds, Union forces continued to pour into Gettysburg, taking up positions on the ridges south of the town. The fighting raged throughout the day, with both sides suffering heavy casualties. By evening, the Confederates had driven the Union forces back through the town of Gettysburg, but the Union still held the high ground on Cemetery Hill, Culp's Hill, and Cemetery Ridge, a formidable defensive position. As night fell, General George Meade arrived on the scene. He quickly assessed the situation and made the crucial decision to stand and fight. Meade ordered his men to fortify their positions on the high ground, preparing for the inevitable Confederate assault. He knew that Lee would not give up easily. If the Union was to hold Gettysburg, they would have to endure some of the fiercest fighting of the war. Lee, on the other hand, was confident that his army could deliver a decisive blow to the Union forces. Despite the day's heavy fighting and the strong Union position, he believed that his troops could break through. Lee's plan for the day was ambitious. He would attack the Union flanks, hoping to collapse Meade's defensive line and seize the high ground. If successful, it could spell disaster for the Union army and open the road to Washington, D.C. July 2nd would prove to be a day of brutal, close-quarter combat. Lee's generals, James Longstreet on the right and Richard Ewell on the left, were tasked with carrying out the assaults on the Union flanks. But as the morning gave way to the afternoon, it became clear that things were not going according to plan. On the Union left, at a place called Little Round Top, a brigade of Union soldiers from Maine, led by Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, found themselves at the center of the action. Little Round Top was a small, rocky hill at the extreme southern end of the Union line, and it was crucial to the Union's defense. If the Confederates could capture it, they could enfilade the entire Union line from the south. Chamberlain, a former college professor with no formal military training before the war, understood the stakes. As waves of Confederate soldiers charged up the hill, Chamberlain's men held their ground, repelling attack after attack. But as the afternoon wore on, his soldiers were running low on ammunition, and another Confederate assault was imminent. In a desperate move, Chamberlain ordered a bayonet charge down the slope of Little Round Top. The unexpected attack caught the Confederates off guard, and Chamberlain's men were able to drive them back securing the hill and saving the Union flank. It was a heroic stand that would become one of the most famous actions of the battle, earning Chamberlain the Medal of Honor and cementing his plays in Civil War history. While the Union left held firm, the Confederate assault on the right was met with equally fierce resistance. Ewell's men attempted to storm Culp's Hill, but the Union defenders, entrenched behind strong fortifications, repelled the attack. By the end of the day, the Union line had held, but the cost in lives was staggering. The fighting of July the 2nd had been fierce, but the battle was far from over. Lee was not ready to give up. 
he believed that a concentrated attack on the center of the Union line could still carry the day. The next day would see the climatic moment of the battle, the infamous charge that would go down in history as Pickett's Charge. But for now, as the sun set on Gettysburg on July 2nd, both armies were battered and exhausted. The outcome of the battle hung in the balance, and the fate of the nation was still very much in doubt. The morning of July 3rd, 1863, dawned with a sense of grim anticipation. Both the Union and Confederate forces knew that the day would bring a decisive conclusion to the Battle of Gettysburg. General Robert E. Lee, undeterred by the brutal fighting of the previous days, was convinced that one final, massive assault could break the Union line and secure a Confederate victory. This belief set the stage for what would become one of the most infamous and tragic moments in the Civil War, Pickett's Charge. Lee's plan for July 3rd was straightforward yet daring. He believed that the Union Center, positioned along Cemetery Ridge, had been weakened by relentless fighting of July 2nd. If Confederate forces could punch through this center, they could split the Union Army in two, leading to its collapse. Lee entrusted this pivotal attack to General George Pickett, a division commander under James Longstreet. Pickett, known for his flamboyant personality and impeccable grooming, was eager to prove himself in battle, having missed much of the earlier fighting. However, Longstreet, who was tasked with overseeing the assault, was far less confident. He had already voiced his concerns to Lee about the feasibility of such a frontal attack, especially against a well-entrenched enemy. Longstreet knew that the open field between Seminary Ridge, where the Confederate forces were positioned, and Cemetery Ridge, where the Union forces awaited, would offer little cover. The men would be marching directly into a storm of artillery and rifle fire. Longstreet's hesitation was palpable. But Lee's decision was final. Pickett's men would lead the charge. Around 1 p.m., after a massive artillery bombardment intended to soften the Union defenses, which, in reality, did far less damage than intended, Pickett's division, along with troops from other divisions, began their fateful advance. Approximately 12,500 Confederate soldiers stepped out of the tree line on Seminary Ridge and started their march across the open fields towards the Union Center, a distance of about three quarters of a mile. As they marched, the Union artillery, positioned on the high ground of Cemetery Ridge, opened fire. The cannons unleashed a deadly barrage of shell and canister, tearing through the Confederate ranks. Soldiers fell by the dozens, but the line pressed on. The sound of the battle was deafening. The cacophony of cannon fire, the crack of muskets, and the shouts of men trying to maintain their formation under the withering fire. As the Confederates drew closer to the Union line, Union infantrymen added their fire to the deadly mix. From behind stone walls and hastily constructed breastwork, the Union soldiers unleashed volleys of rifle fire. The Confederates continued forward, but their ranks were rapidly thinning. The open field became a killing ground, with entire companies being cut down in minutes. Despite the horrific casualties, some Confederate soldiers reached the stone wall that marked the Union line. In what was often referred to as the high water mark of the Confederacy, a small group of men, led by Brigadier General Louis Armstead, actually breached the Union defenses. Armstead, with his hat on the tip of his sword, urged his men forward, but the breakthrough was short-lived. Union reinforcements quickly closed the gap, and the Confederate assault faltered. Within moments, what was left of the Confederate forces began to retreat. The field was littered with the dead and the dying, a grim testament to the futility of the charge. Pickett's division, which had started the day with around 5,000 men, was nearly annihilated. When Pickett himself returned to Lee, the general asked him to rally his division for another attack. Pickett's heartbreaking response was, General Lee, I have no division. The failure of Pickett's charge marked the end of the Battle of Gettysburg. Lee, 
who had been so confident in the success of the assault, now faced the reality of a devastating defeat. He rode out to meet his retreating troops, taking full responsibility for the failure, saying, It's all my fault, boys. His men, however, still held him in high regard, and many would go on to fight under his command until the very end of the war. For the Union, Gettysburg was a significant victory but it had come at a tremendous cost. Both sides suffered staggering casualties, over 50,000 in total, making Gettysburg the bloodiest battle of the Civil War. General George Meade, who had only recently taken command of the Army of the Potomac, had successfully repelled Lee's invasion, but he was criticized for not pursuing the retreating Confederate army more aggressively. The Battle of Gettysburg was a turning point in the Civil War. It marked the last time that Lee would attempt a major offensive operation in the North. The defeat at Gettysburg, coupled with the fall of Vicksburg on July 4th, dealt a severe blow to Confederate morale and made it increasingly difficult for the South to continue the fight. We've reached a pivotal moment in the Civil War. The twin victories at Gettysburg and Vicksburg stripped the Confederacy of its momentum, shifting the tide decisively in favor of the Union. From this point forward, it would be the Union setting the terms of the conflict. While the bloodshed of 1863 and 1864 was far from over, the Union had, once again, been spared from the brink of defeat. Next time, on Double Helix, we'll explore the aftermath of Gettysburg and the rest of 1863. We will also explore the final and most brutal phase of the war. We'll dive into the relentless campaigns of 1864, the rise of General Grant, and the Union strategy of total war. We'll also bring light to the pivotal role of African-American soldiers as they fight not just for the Union, but for their freedom and the future of the nation. The stakes are higher than ever, and the war's end is within sight. But the path there will be one of the most difficult yet. Thank you for listening. We will see you soon. Glory, 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 hallelujah.